lesson tonight first, and we'll have some singing here in a minute. Turn to the book of Genesis chapter 14 with me tonight. Genesis 14, Bereshith in Hebrew. Genesis 14, verse 17. Genesis 14, 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Ketalormer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is in the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, or Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Father, bless your holy word now. And give me the gift of teaching. In thy name we pray. Amen. It helps to have a little chronology of the Old Testament. It makes a big difference. Archbishop Usher established what we know as the, as the was the accepted chronology for a long time. At the creation of Adam at 4000 B.C., the flood is 2,355 B.C. Abraham is about 1900 B.C. Moses, about 1400 B.C. Uh, David, 1000 B.C. 586 B.C., the southern two tribes carried off into Babylonian captivity. 722 B.C., the two northern tribes carried off into captivity. Seventy years later, they returned according to the prophecy of Jeremiah. The canon of Scripture was closed about 504-something B.C., the book of Malachi. There's a fellow by the name of George Dodwell. He's an Australian. I mentioned this in Sunday school. I guess it's been over a year ago now. An Australian, George Dodwell. He did a lot of research into this. And he says that he can prove that in 2345 B.C., the Earth's axis shifted. Now that coincides with the date of the flood. The flood, 2345 B.C., caused the axis of the Earth to shift, and when it shifted, we have our seasons. We have the four seasons. The Earth is spinning on an axis at about 22 and a half, 23 degrees off center. And at that angle, as I said a moment ago, it gives you your seasons. But not only is it spinning on an axis of about 23 degrees, it wobbles. How many has ever spun a top? Spun a top. All right. You see the top as it slows down. You, it's still spinning, but the top, top of it's doing this. All right. That's what's happening to the earth. The Bible says in prophecy that the day will come when the earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard. Which makes me think that the axis is going to change even more. And it's going to be profound. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the stars falling from heaven to the earth. Things of that nature. So we don't know exactly what effect it's going to have. But we know it's going to have one. In Genesis chapter number 6, the sons of God came down and saw the daughters of men bore children to them. And these children were giants. The giants and the legend of the giants was passed down through the flood through Nimrod into Babylon. Babylon is the fountainhead of all idolatry. Remember that. It's the fountainhead. So when God got ready to call a man and reveal himself to that man, reveal the truth to that man, he called him right smack out of the middle of it. He called Abraham, which at that time his name was Abram, from Ur of the Chaldees. He had only been removed about 400 years from the universal flood that covered the earth. About 400 year period of time. Hadn't been long, folks. In Bible chronology, that's nothing. That's yesterday. So he'd been, he'd be, he was removed about 400 years from the flood, 1900 B.C. He calls Abram from Ur of the Chaldees and reveals himself to him. But now when he revealed himself to Abram from Ur of the Chaldees, he called him from Ur of the Chaldees. But Abraham comes in contact with a man here that is in the west. He's in Jerusalem. At that time, it's called, uh, it's called Jebus. It means a city of peace. Yerushalayim is the way they say it in Hebrew. It means the city of peace. At this time, 
He comes in contact face to face with a priest king 1,900 years before Christ. That's who Melchizedek is. He's a priest king. It's a conjunction of two words in Hebrew. Melek, which is king, and Sedek, which is righteous. So he is the king of righteousness. Melek Sedek or Melchizedek. He's the king of peace. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of Jerusalem. He's the king of Jebus. He's a king and a priest. And he was recognized immediately by Abram as being superior to him. The Bible says here in the book of Genesis, chapter number 14, that when Melchizedek showed up, he brought bread and wine. Now, we know that when this sacrifice and offering started with Abel, we understood that the sacrifice of a lamb is what God required to expiate sin or to cover sin or to do away with sin. Not the fruit of the ground, but the life of an individual, the life of the lamb, the blood of the lamb. So it developed into a simple thing. That the bread represented the body and the wine represented the blood. So as far back as 1900 B.C. when Melchizedek brought bread and wine to Abram, it was fully understood by Abram at that time that bread and wine represented a sacrifice that God would accept. Now this is 500 years, 500 years or, uh, yeah, no, about 450, 450, 475, before the Aaronic priesthood was ever established, before Moses ever lived. Moses is about 1400 B.C. We're looking at hundreds of years before that. They fully understood that the blood sacrifice was necessary. And, of course, the bread represented the body of the blood sacrifice. And this is we, this what we have here is the truth of the true faith in God in the face of a time when it was being perverted like Nimrod. You read that in Genesis chapter number 10. That's called the table of the nations. The table of the nations represent the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If you'll go home and read that and pray over that, you'll find out where all people were dispersed from. They came from Shem, Ham, or Japheth. The name Shem means name. If you say Hashem today in Hebrew, you're saying the name. And you'll find, if you do any reading at all in Jewish literature, you'll find that many times when you're reading along, you'll come to something and they'll say, Hashem. Then you'll read along, they'll say, Hashem. You read along, they'll say, Hashem. Or if you find God in Jewish, you'll see a G and then a dash. They will not say the word God. And they will not even come close to saying, uh, yod He vau He, which is the Tetragrammaton, which we call Jehovah. Is, is how we translated that. We took the, uh, the Masorites, took the vowel points from uh, Adonai and put it to yod heh vowel He, and this is where we get uh, Je uh, Jehovah. So they have, a, they, have a, they have an honor for the sacred name of God. Now, there's a problem with that if in, in so-called among some Christians because it's all about the sacred name with them and not about the sacred son. Amen. Don't get tied up with the name. He that hath the son, not he that hath a name. He that hath a son hath life. This is why the Bible says things that when you get in there and you begin to look at them and compare them, you'll find out where the wrong lies. The scripture will never lead you wrong. But anyway, when we have this in Genesis chapter number 14, we have an encounter between a priest king and the man who is going to be the progenitor of all of the tribes that worship God. The source of truth, the light is going to come through Abram, Isaac, and Israel. Or Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And I talked to you about them last Wednesday night. I told you how that these are the fathers that you see recorded over there in the book of uh, Romans chapter number 11. The fathers. This is the source of truth. The Bible says in the book of Romans that to them was given the oracles of God. There are elements out here in the world. I was talking to somebody today. I think it was Brother Valence about the Chinese. And I've mentioned to you before about the Chinese. In some of their glyphs, the Chinese have record of Noah. They have a record of a flood. They not only that, they have a record of eight people who come through the flood to the other side. The Chinese have that. But that's a partial, that's a partial revelation. And the part where the part agrees with the scripture and where they have something like that, good for them, God bless them. But the source of truth is the Bible. You follow me now? The Word of God judges everything and everybody. It's got to come back to the book. He said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. So in 1900 B.C., Melchizedek and Abraham meet. 
I want you to notice the context of it. Abraham meets this king priest when he is separated from the Sodomites. <laughs> Amen. This king priest shows up when he comes back from rescuing his nephew Lot from being taken carried captive in a regional war. And that's what goes on leading up to this thing. A regional war. Kings against kings. You, back in those days, many of them that were kings were simply a king of a city. And that's all that you're not talking about like King David who was a king of a nation. And he handed a nation to Solomon. And that nation wound up being split under Solomon to the ten northern tribes and the two southern. But a lot of the kings back then were simply kings of a, of a, of a, of a city. So we find an encounter between a king priest and the man that God is going to bless the earth through. Now notice carefully, Melchizedek blessed Abram. God had blessed Abram. He said, through you shall all nations be blessed. Your people. He said to Abram, he said, if they curse you, I'll curse them. If they bless you, I'll bless them. Nowhere in that Bible has that ever changed. If it has, find it for me. It hasn't changed. I'll bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So the blessing was the prophecy and the promise from God. And the actual blessing came from the hand of Melchizedek. For Melchizedek blessed him. And once Abram was blessed, nobody could ever curse him. And from that moment on, he was the father of the fathers of the father. And he's the one you find in the book of Romans chapter number 11 when it talks about the holy lump. In Romans 11, it's talking about a holy lump. It's talking about where everything came from. And when you look at all the Gentiles, all the Gentile nations, most of, the, most of us today in this house from the Gentiles are from Japheth. And the Gentiles are wild. It's a wild olive branch graft in to the natural olive branch. Which goes against nature. But grace is against nature. Because our nature is to sin. Our nature is to go away from God. And grace brings us back to God. It's the hand of grace where God's able to deal with mankind. So the biggest mystery in the Bible is who is this Melchizedek? This man that is so much greater than Abram. Because the Bible says the less is blessed to the greater. In Hebrews chapter number 7, which is a New Testament commentary on what you're reading about in Romans 4, in, in Genesis 14. It's a New Testament commentary on that. It tells you plainly that the less is blessed of the greater. Who is this Melchizedek? Some say it's Shem. They say it's got to be Shem. Well, Shem was still alive at this time. Remember, Shem was the son of Noah. We're, can't, we're transitioning from the old world into the new world. Eight souls have carried, been carried across the flood. Shem is alive. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And we will dwell in the tents of Shem. And if you want to find out the true line of God and where it came, go to Shem. Find Shem. And you'll find him in Genesis 10, the table of the nations that I was telling you about a moment ago. The problem with that, though, is that it says in Hebrews chapter number 7, he didn't have a father and he didn't have a mother. So that kind of eliminates Shem. Some say, well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, look at Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 8. Hebrews 7, 8. Let's see. 7, 3. I knew my memory would fail me somewhere. Now, I went through an awful lot of stuff before I got to this point. <laughs> it would do you good to smile. Amen. <laughs> I did pretty good until I got to that one verse. Verse 3. Watch this. Without father, without mother, without descent... Having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, now watch this, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now we've got something here before us. Here's the problem. If Melchizedek is the Lord Jesus Christ, then obviously this is what we call a theophany. What's that? That is a physical appearance of the Son of God before he was incarnate. And we have that a number of places in the Old Testament. All right. But here's the problem with it. It says made like unto the Son of God. Now, there is no question that Melchizedek is a type of Christ. No question. He absolutely a beautiful type. But is he the Lord Jesus Christ? There's the problem. Now, look at verse number three again. It says that he abideth the priest how? How long? 
Continually. Well, now the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the teaching of the book of Hebrews, is a high priest, not after the order of, Mel, uh, of, uh, of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek forever. There is no end to his priesthood. See, this is we're talking about the priesthood tonight. Now, there is no end to it. There's no stopping point out here. You remember I made a big deal about how that when the, when the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, came down from heaven. The God-man did not come down from heaven. The Son of God came down from heaven. The God-man ascended back to heaven. In other words, a spirit being, the Lord Jesus Christ, descended from heaven and a man ascended back to heaven. And that man was received to the right hand of the Father. The man was received at his right hand. And the Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who? The man, Christ Jesus. So, the second person of the Trinity became a man. Will he ever unbecome a man? No. 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 For the Bible says he liveth continually. He has, a, he has an eternal, everlasting priesthood. His work today as a priest is not for you to be born again. You are born again of the Spirit of the living God by accepting the witness of the Holy Ghost, John chapter 16. When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convince the world of sin because they believe not on Me. The moment that you're born again, you have accepted the witness of the Holy Spirit of God. You have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart and into your soul. And from that moment on, that will never change. You cannot be unborn again. That's eternal security. But your life needs to be saved. Because your life lived by the soul that is in your body. Your life one day could be lived for Satan, the next day for the Lord. And if you don't watch it, the first thing you know, you're going to waste your life. It's going to wind up a shipwreck somewhere. And this is the ministry of our high priest at the right hand of the Father. That when it talks about we are saved by his life. And that's exactly what happens. We are saved by his life. But we're going to pass on from this earth. Then there's going to come generation after generation after generation after generation into the future. And all of those people that come into the future will be part of the, part of the family of God. They need a priest. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. There never will be another way of salvation apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not, nor will it ever exist. There's only one blood covenant, folks. There's not two covenants. There's not a covenant for the Jew and a covenant for the Gentile. There's one blood covenant. Don't, I don't know where that flim flam ever got started. That's garbage. There is one blood covenant that at the cross at Calvary, He bore the sin, God was in Christ, reconciling the world, Jew and Gentile, unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath, the Bible says, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. And right now, we Gentiles have benefit of that one covenant, and it's called the New Testament. And I've talked about that from the book of Hebrews. In, Roman, in the Hebrews chapter number 8, quoting Jeremiah chapter number 31, the Jews will one day acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they will come under the benefit of the blood covenant at Calvary, and it will be the same blood washing their sins away that washed my sins away. Amen. He doesn't have one covenant for the Jew and one for the Gentile. One covenant. One blood covenant. So our high priest right now, according to the book of Hebrews chapter number 7, is after the order of Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Me not know. <laughs> I'm not going to take a firm stand one way or another. I mean, I, you know, there's... there's a lot, of, a lot of smart men have given a lot of ideas, conjectures about it. But you can't prove anything when it comes to Melchizedek. So what does that mean? That means that God holds within his own person and his own mind certain mysteries that one day we'll find out from him. If God had really wanted us to know, I guess he'd told us, wouldn't he? Amen. So, but I've heard some guys on the radio, and they'll, uh, I heard one the other day, it hadn't been long ago. He says, I will prove to you by the time this broadcast is over who Melchizedek was. I got about halfway through, and I had to get something to eat, so I didn't have time to hear everything he had to say. <laughs> but he didn't prove anything, because you can't prove it. No way, you can't prove it. Just leave it the way it is. 
It's good too. Don't you think it's good to have a little bit of a mystery about something? I mean, after all, the Bible talks about the time of the book of Revelation when the mystery of God will be revealed. What's that talking about? We know God, Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost. But there's a mystery about God and the Godhead that has yet to be revealed. And I think it has more to do with what it, than, than what he says in 1 John 3 when it says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we see him we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's a revelation of the glorification of Christ in its complete glory. We're going to see that. But I believe it's talking about the Godhead. And the Godhead's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing, folks. Godhead. So the Lord Jesus Christ is God the Son. And you remember I told you last Wednesday night, the New Testament quotes this scripture. Look at Psalm chapter number 2 and verse number 7. It quotes it over and over and over again. Psalm chapter number 2. Verse number 7. Psalm 2, 7. Look at this carefully now. I will declare the decree. Jehovah, the capital L-O-R-D, the Lord, Jehovah. You, you, are you following me? If you've never, if anytime you have large, the uppercase, L-O-R-D, all letters uppercase, that's Jehovah. That's the tetragrammaton. That's yod heh vow heh with the Masoretic points on it. And that's where we get the word Jehovah. But what they do is put Lord here. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. The New Testament applies that in three different places. It applies it to the birth of Christ. Born of the Virgin. Mary. The Lord Jesus Christ's mother. Mary is not the mother of God. That's Sophia. The mother of God is that church over there in Constantinople, Istanbul, Turkey, Hagia Sophia. That is Gnosticism that goes all the way back to Plato and the Monad because that puts her before God, right? Is not the mother before God? Is not the mother before the child? All right. So if she's the mother of God, that makes her preceding God. And of course, when they say God, they're not saying the same thing you are. Semantics runs wild in this. Mary is the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, the virgin daughter of Zion. A virgin shall conceive, Isaiah said. Matthew quotes that. She was a virgin. She, was the, she bore the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. What seed was that? That was the seed that it talks about in the book of Galatians when the Apostle Paul talks about not to seeds which are many, but to thy seed which is one. And that seed is Christ. There's only one of all the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was only one seed, and it didn't come from any of them. It came from God, the seed of the woman. All right. All right. It applies to the birth. Then in the book of, in the book of, uh, of uh, Acts 13, look there. Acts 13, verse 33. Acts 13, 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. There's a second quotation. Same passage, but this time... He applies it to the resurrection. Now look at it this way. Did the Lord Jesus Christ become the Son of God at the resurrection? Now think about that for a moment. No, He didn't. He didn't become the Son of God at the resurrection. All right, then, therefore, when it says, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, He's speaking in a different sense, a different context. If he did not become the Son of God at the resurrection, which he did not, then he's saying that he has been put forth, recognized as my Son because of his power over death. Okay? We see him now. Death could not hold him. And he arose from the dead. 
And Paul, when he wrote the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 4, he said he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And now look what Peter does to it. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. Now think about this. This is one of the twelve. 1 Peter 1, 3. The Apostle Peter, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It was when he was declared to be the Son of God. It was when he was set apart to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, declared that by that act and that power and authority, the begetting, your new birth, is connected directly with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I ask you this. Uh, just look at the prescripture. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 2. Verse 1. Ephesians 2, 1. Ephesians 2, 1. I told you I've been to Ephesus. I went there one time. One of the most remarkable places I've ever seen in my life. It blew my mind away. I'm going to tell you why. I've seen rubble. I've seen, I've seen piles of stone. I've seen them everywhere. All over the Holy Land. But I had never walked down the street of a city over 2,000 years old and see the buildings on either side and the library at the end of the street just like it was 2,000 years ago. That, that got me. That got me. And when I ran, went around the corner, there's the, there's the place where they scream for hours, Great as Diana. You remember that one, the book of Acts? Sitting, you're sitting right there. We went in there, sat down on the seats. They're real close together. I guess the people were smaller back then. I don't know what it was. But we all went in, all these guys went with me. We climbed about halfway up and we looked down on the down there and we looked at each other and said, This is where it happened, right here. And we just looked at this is it. We're sitting right where we read about it in the book of Acts. And it does something to you. Yeah. I mean, that's powerful stuff. Yeah. And I thought to myself, man, they screamed about how great is Diana. Great is Diana, but nobody's screaming it now. We're up here preaching Christ and him crucified. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They told us when uh, 2,000 years ago when, when uh, the Apostle Paul left Ephesus, if you read about the book of Acts, he left Ephesus. If you remember, the elders went down to the water's edge. They kissed him. They hugged. And, he, and, and they said, we'll never see your face again. We'll never see you again. And uh, it was a terrible, it was, it was a parting. It was a departing, a parting of ways. And he had to go because he was a missionary and church planter. But the water then at Ephesus was, uh, they said, uh, was, just a, was just a few hundred feet away from, from the edge of the, uh, of the city. It wasn't far. It wasn't far at all. But now, if you go to Ephesus, it's way out there. It's a long way to get to the water. And that's because stuff has changed over time. If you ever get the opportunity, if you ever do, you'll never forget it to go to a town like that. That's something else. I went there with Brother Bevington. I'm so glad for the trips that I took with Brother Bevington. But what he says right here in verse number 1 of, of Ephesians to the church at Ephesus, verse 1. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. See this? They had been changed. They had been saved. And they'd been made alive. And that's all happens when you're born again. That's the new birth. The new birth is not at the end of a good life as a reward. The new birth is totally based on your faith in Christ and receiving Him. I can't emphasize that enough. He that hath the Son hath life. To receive the Son of God. How do you do that, preacher? You have to do it individually. There is no formula. There is no formula in the New Testament to get saved. You simply bow your head, acknowledge that you're a sinner, 
that He's the Savior. Confess Him in your heart that He's who you need. Call on Him to save you. And then believe on Him. Yes. Sirs, what must I do to the, to the Philippian jailers? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The apostle said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The Greek word believe is pistuo. It doesn't mean that you agree intellectually to a bunch of facts. It means that you reach out and embrace with all of your heart and all of your soul. You receive into your heart and into your soul. The Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Have you ever been to the point where you, somebody put you to sleep and you didn't know if you was ever going to wake up again? I've been there a number of times. Do you know the last word on my, I said before I went out? You know what? I, I wasn't talking about money. I wasn't talking about the Dodgers. I wasn't talking about the balls. You know what? I, the last word that I said before I went out? Jesus. 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 And you know what? He went in there with me. He went in there with me. And then when I woke up, Jesus. 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 You'd be amazed at how many of those nurse, nurses and doctors over there will pray with you. The receiving Christ. You go to one church that says you keep the commandments. Another one says you have to, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to have the, the graces of the church. Another one says you have, you have to do penance. Another one says, well, uh, you can't really know for sure until the end of your life. Another one says, well, do the best you can and you're still going to go to purgatory and we'll try to get you out of there. And this and that and this and that and this and that. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. First John is not written to get you saved. It's not written to get you saved. It's written to confirm your salvation. It is. It's written to confirm it. Now John's gospel is, these things are written that you might believe. But First John is written to Christians to confirm their faith. So he's, uh, he's, he's prophet, he's priest, he died as a priest, and uh, he died as a prophet and rose as a priest. Uh, I re remind you of that again. He died as a prophet and rose as a priest, and he will come as king. Amen. Amen. So he is, he, is, he, is, he is Melchizedek in every sense of the word, in the sense that Melchizedek was a type of Christ, and the Lord Jesus, there is no greater king of righteousness than him. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is king of righteousness. And the Apostle John in 1 John makes it clear. If you say you know Him and you continue in your sin and you practice your sin and you wallow around and you, and you parade your sin in front of people and you make excuses for your sin and defend your sin, you don't know Him. You don't know Him. You don't know Him. You don't know Him. That's it. Still in darkness. Still in darkness. And you don't have the light. But the Apostle Peter makes it clear here. Begotten again into a lively hope. Yeah. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, in 2345 B.C., the rain 40 days, 40 nights, the fountains of the deep were broken, the heavens opened, the water came down, and the earth shifted on its axis. When it shifted on its axis, it created, by doing that, a view of the heavens that are changing. How many has ever heard of the precession of the equinoxes? I've taught that in Sunday school, taught about it a number of times. All you got to do is just type it into Google, precession of the equinoxes. It takes 26,000 and something, 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 something years to go from point A all the way back to point A again. And nobody, of course, is going to live that long. But if you lived long enough, and in a short span of our lifetime, if you knew the exact location of the stars above your head, you would see there'd be a minute change in their position. That's the precession. They're moving. They're not going forward. They're going backward. Not the procession, but the precession of the equinoxes. Do you know what the North Star is? All right. If you're in North, if you're in the northern latitudes, if you're at, if you're at the, uh, uh, if you're at the. Uh, 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 not magnetic north, but uh, but physical geographical north. If you're looking up at the North Star, it won't move. It'll just be right there. Deviate from that any, and you'll see the North Star begin to move. The further down you get, the more the North Star will move. The reason for that is because of the wobbling of the Earth on its axis. Okay, that North Star has changed. The North Star 
in 2345 B.C. was not the one that's there now. It was Alpha Draconis. A dragon, the dragon. God wrote a message in the heavens to prepare the people that were crossing from that old world into the new world. He did not leave himself without a witness. Now think about this for a moment. When was the first scripture written? I gave you that timeline a few minutes ago. Who wrote the first book of the Bible? Moses. When? Well, that's when Abraham lived and that's when Job lived. And, well, okay, let me explain myself because you're, you're hitting on the right thing. It goes like this. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Ever, you'll probably, you'll, you'll find universal agreement on that. Job is dated as a contemporary of Abraham. When was that? 1,900 B.C. But as far as writing the first book of the Bible, we know who, we know who wrote the first book of the Bible. And who was that? Exactly. God told him to write a book. wrote the Pentateuch. When was that? 1400 B.C. But there's an iffy here. What's the if, preacher? The if is simply this. Since we don't know who wrote Job, we don't know when Job was written. Right? That makes sense. It's possible. There's a, there's a pretty strong tradition that says Moses wrote Job. And this is like Melchizedek. Can't prove it one way or another. You can't say. But on the other hand, since we don't know who wrote Job, it's possible that Job could have been written 1,900 years before Christ. And did you know that the book of Job talks about a flood? And it's giving, it gives a number of names for Satan. And the names that it gives for Satan match up with what they see up there in the heavens at night. All that is in the book of Job. It's in the book of Job. 1,900 B.C. God did not leave himself without a witness. He could have given a little bit over here, a little bit over there, a little bit of witness here, a little bit there. And you'd have to put it together, collate it. But that's not what he did. He called Abram from Ur of the Chaldees. Called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. And his great, 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 great grandson wrote the first book of the Bible. Moses. That's where it came from. That's what we've got tonight. Salvation is of the Lord. It's of the Lord. There are two simple lines of revelation in this world. One is the truth of God's word and the other one is the devil. Darwinian evolution came straight out of hell. It came through Nimrod. If you, if you read what Nimrod, and I, if you just read some of the myth that goes along with Nimrod, you'll find out that evolution is right smack in the middle of Nimrod. You'll find it right there. Okay? It didn't originate with Charles Darwin. It's right there. So think about it for a minute. You've got evolution and Nimrod and Babylon, and you've got God's revelation through Abram of Ur of the Chaldees. You make a choice. Which one will it be tonight? I choose the book. I choose Abraham. I receive Christ. He's my Lord Jesus Christ. Evolution is a lie. It's a lie that cannot be supported by fact. Don't ever be fooled with it. It's a bunch of flim flam. <laughs> yes, it is. It's garbage. And for the first 27 years of my life, I believed it. Until I came face to face with the Almighty. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word. Bless your word tonight. Bless it to the people. Heavenly Father, give us light. And then when we have the light, Lord, let us receive it and walk in the light. Not reject it. Not try to, not try to change it. But just simply say, take it as it is, the word of God. And we understand tonight that there are definitely two lines of revelation in this world. One from Satan and one from thee. Bless your word now. In Jesus' name. Amen.